So could you each describe your entry point into the conversation about self-expression and the authentic self? Where and how do you begin? And how do your respective disciplines of fashion and philosophy inform your perspectives? Why don't we uh, start with Professor Dietenbacher? Thank you so much, Emily. Um, I think as I was thinking about this question, I had to first start with my own um, personal position. Uh, so I'm a practicing Christian. And um, so for me, speaking about the self um, is, is obviously interchangeable with the discussion around the soul and what that means. Um, and in, in my research as well, I've really been keen to kind of um, look at the human condition from the perspective of an integrated position on the embodied soul, um, really kind of trying to disrupt that platonic divide between the mind over the body and just kind of resituating, I think, what the biblical account really um, speaks to of that integrated experience of what it means to be human. Um, so for me, I think um, thinking about this in terms of you know what it, what it means to live that out in terms of an authentic self as a Christian. As I, you know, I think about passages in the Bible that speak about this sort of paradox of um, you know putting on the new self, right, and taking off the old self. So this is an exchange um, when you become a Christian. You sort of take on um, those attributes of the divine, right, and also very um, cognizant of the imago Deo, right, and the belief that we all um, are imbued with divine attributes. Um, so these, these sort of are the pieces of the puzzle that sort of have been um, thinking, I've been thinking about in answering that question in terms of authenticity in the self for me as a Christian, living that out in the world. Um, and also just this sense of this kind of juxtaposition of um, reversal in a way, because in a way, obviously as a believer, um, there's this kind of sense of, you know, there's a biblical passage or statement which talks about like he being God increasing and me decreasing, right? So it's almost it's almost like this upending where the self is last and God is more in my life. And it's a continuum. It's this constant kind of back and forth um, where I'm obviously, you know, there's a, almost like a battle, right? There's this internal struggle, right? Between me seeking to um, live out my faith more and honor God versus this battle of the sort of brokenness of the self that is contending with that, right? Um, on my discipline, um, fashion, uh, there's so much to be said about this. I don't even know where to start, but um, when, you, when, you, when I think about it from the perspective of fashion studies, every time when I was doing my MA in fashion studies, um, Culture, fashion and cultural theories had to always contend with this platonic divide and this kind of tension between the body and the soul or the interior and the exterior, the sense of who we are on the outside um, and this inner self that was the true self, right? Um, and fashion or clothing is always kind of framed in that context as either a reconciler or... Um, sort of a negotiating sort of activity, right? The performance of putting on clothes, of being dressed, of um, facilitating who we are in the world. Um, that's the role of clothing, right? Um, even though I'm here as a whatever and have expertise in fashion, that's my field, we are all engaged in fashion because you are all dressed, right? You all came here today wearing clothing. I'm pretty sure everyone is clothed tonight. Um, but um, that, you know, you are... That, that's facilitating some kind of way of um, being in the world, right? It's, it's facilitating a social engagement between yourself and the other or yourself and the world or society. So um, fashion is playing this complicated role in our lives in terms of helping us negotiate ourselves in the world. Um, you know, there's maybe so much more we can say later about the authenticity of that and when that changes and shifts. Um, and really, I think that the fashion, fashion just really is, is a, it's a means of communication in a way of my project that Emily mentioned, Dress and Emotion, really is looking at um, the ability of dress to communicate your emotion, your emot emotional state. Um, you know, when you think about, you think about when you're feeling down or what we've all been through, right? Nobody's dressing up to go out, right? Everybody's just at home in their sweatpants, right, or only dressing from the top up because that's the only time. 
part of, of you that's seen on Zoom, right? Because that's the only piece that matters about yourself is what you're, what's up here and people are seeing. Um, so it's a whole, the interior, exterior thing takes on a whole nother level. Um, so I don't know if I answered the question. Or, I think you did. Very okay, good. all right. Uh, so uh, Socrates notoriously asked a, a flat-footed sort of question of the form, what is X? pretty much every time he met anybody, right? What is justice? What is piety? What is knowledge? Uh, and it isn't just that he started there, but he tended to kind of sit with that question a lot and sometimes not get pa much past that question. And I don't want us to not get past that question, but I do, I, I, I guess I agree with Socrates that it's important to start there. And I think in this particular case, when we're talking about authenticity and the self, um, it's, it's not just that it's, as it were, good housekeeping to start with the question of what is authenticity and what is the self, but it's also, these are unbelievably hard uh, concepts. Uh, I mean, again, in general, Socrates' question is, on the one hand, it's clear that we have to understand what the thing is in order to even meaningfully ask the question. We have to, in some sense, know what knowledge is in order to even ask what it is. It's not just a meaningless word. On the other hand, it turns out to be unbelievably difficult, usually, to get a satisfying answer to the question. Um, Augustine famously said, I know what time is until anybody t asks me what time is, and then I have no idea what time is. Uh, uh, so anyway, that, I think that, uh, I, I'm, I'm certainly hoping to get out of uh, uh, this evening's discussion, a, a better answer to those questions than I currently have. What, what authenticity is? What do we mean when we say something's authentic or inauthentic? Um, at, maybe as we're, as we're going along, it needn't be something that we st literally start mm. addressing, but it's something that I want us to, to uh, get at uh, tonight. Um, but anyway, I think that's a, a, a mm -hmm. way in which my uh, area of philosophy mm -hmm. would, te sort of, would tend to approach uh, uh, the topic that we're talking about tonight, and it would tend to shape the discussion uh, 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 in that direction. Um, uh, so that's, 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 that's a, so to speak, what philosophy might uh, uh, say about this. Um, on a more personal level, I, like I take it everybody in this room, I, I have the concept of authenticity, or at least I have, I, I, I use that idea, however imperfectly, and I wor worry about whether I'm living an authentic life, I worry about whether this part of my life is authentic or in inauthentic, um, despite the fact that I'm not totally sure <laughs> what, the, what, what the concept is. Um, but at the same time, I have real doubts, I have sort of some skeptical worries about both of those main concepts, about the, as it were, the validity of the concept of authenticity and the validity of the concept of the self. Um, I'm not at all sure that th those doubts are good doubts or you know, well-founded doubts. Um, um, and so again, uh, uh, as we're speaking selfishly, another thing I want out of tonight and by, from talking to Fiona and Emily and you guys is, um, is to see whether these worries that I have about uh, the, the, the coherence or the, the meaningfulness of these ideas is, is legitimate worry or whether I'm just wrong about this, which I think I'm, I may very well be. Um, <laughs> Uh, but I, I won't. I won't say what my skeptical worries are right now. I'll, I'll say that in a few <laughs> a few minutes when we're when we're when we're talking uh, downstream a little bit. But mm -hmm. uh, maybe I'll stop there. Uh. There will be plenty of time to talk yeah. about our skeptical worries. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you for sure. <laughs> um, well, why don't we channel Socrates a little bit and um, ask a question like? Do you think authenticity is a thing? Can it be a thing? So my sort of formal version of that question is, do you think there is an authentic self or a real you that can be known by your own self or by someone else? Um, if there is a real you, how do we know who that self is? How do we access it or find it? Um, how do we know what kind of life goes along with that authentic self or the real you? Um, and if you don't think there is one, first of all, oh no, we'll see, we'll see where that goes. Um, but also, how then can we think about something like a quest for the self or knowing ourselves or others? Um, what do we do if there's no such thing as authenticity? Um, and I guess the sort of bigger part of this question is, how does your own sense of metaphysics um, inform the way that you might answer this question? We, we'll start on this side, yeah, I think. Okay. We'll take turns. Uh, so maybe I'll put the self 
to one side for just a second and focus yeah. on authenticity because these are mm. both nightmares. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. um, but, yeah, so, and it was quick. only it was seventeen questions and one yeah, question. I was just so about to say that you was should a feel lot. free to to pick and choose. Yeah. So so let me. Uh, uh, so my, my, my skeptical answer is no, there's no such thing as the authentic <laughs> self. Uh, by the way, that's not to say all cells are inauthentic. It's to say I think the distinction between authentic and inauthentic may be a bogus distinction. But let, me, let me say why I'm worried that it's a bogus distinction. Um, so uh, um, again, our question is what, is what is authenticity? Rather than try to give a Socratic answer to that question, I, I, I have a, a quote from Oscar Wilde, which I wanted to read, which I, uh, roughly speaking, my thought is, if authenticity is anything, then it's what Wilde is talking about in this quote, uh, uh, or at least a big part of it. So he says, um, it's tragic how few people ever possess their souls before they die. Nothing is more rare in any man, says Emerson, than an act of his own. It is quite true. Most people are other people. Their thoughts are someone else's opinions, their lives a mimicry, their passions a quotation. So that's Oscar Wilde. So again, that's not, a, that's not him trying to def define authenticity. He's just trying to kind of give a, he's using the concept there, but I think we can, we can get the sense of what, he, what he's doing in that, uh, uh, what, he, what he has in mind by authenticity from that thought. Um, I, I can't make sense of what he says there except in something like the following way. And again, I'm not, if anybody here thinks this is a bad characterization of authenticity, you know, I, I look forward to hearing it because I, I feel very unsure about this. But I think you have to have something like the view that there's a fundamental set of beliefs and values that a person has. And then an inauthentic life is a life that isn't lived in, the, in terms of or in the light of those fundamental beliefs and values, but rather is lived in the light of somebody else's beliefs and values, maybe societies or you know, some particular group. Um, so that's a, that's a, that, that is a kind of candidate answer to Socrates' question. What do we mean when we say something's authentic or inauthentic? It's something like that. Uh, authenticity is living your life in terms of your fundamental values and beliefs, and then uh, inauthenticity is, is, is not doing that. And then here's the skeptical worry. The skeptical worry is the very idea of a value or a belief is one where I think we, it's, I think it's internally tied to action, to the idea of action. Um, if, if that's right, you can't, whatever, you, whatever life you live, that's the life that expresses your fundamental values and beliefs. But if that's true, you can't live inauthentically, and in fact, you can't live authentically. The distinction breaks down, right? The whole, if the, if what it, if the idea of living inauthentically is uh, you've got these fundamental values, but you're, as it were, betraying them, you're selling them out and living according to somebody else's values or beliefs, um, then if what I just said is true, you can't live inauthentically because whatever you wind up doing is going to be the expression of your values. And the, the, the reason for thinking that there's that tie between beliefs and values on the one hand and actions on the other is something like, look, we have to explain why you do what you do, no matter what it is. So suppose we meet somebody who we would say goes along with the crowd too much or like is, seems to want to please other people too much or cares too much about the opinions of other people. That's a thing that that person cares about. Otherwise, they wouldn't be doing that, right? Um, so, and, and that caring, that mattering to them, is not somebody else's mattering or caring, it's their mattering or caring. So the thought is, you could say that they're having a bad life, right? You could say that those aren't good values for them to have and they should get some other values. But that's not an inauthentic life if that definition I just gave is right. Um, there's not a, a, a disparity or dissonance between their fundamental outlook and what they're doing. Um, uh, and so again, I'm, I'm very open to the thought that people lead lives in terms of values that aren't good values, right? They live, uh, mm. they, they, they live corrupt, bad lives because their values are corrupt. But that's not the idea of authenticity. The idea of authenticity is a kind of fit between your beliefs and desires on the one hand and your actions or your, the way you live your life on the other, mm. not about the content of your, of your beliefs and desires. Anyway, so that's sort of why I'm a little worried about the concept of authenticity. But I really want to emphasize, it's just a worry. I, I think probably there is such a thing as authenticity and authenticity. I'm just saying I can't quite see what it's supposed to be. Um, uh, sorry, that was only answering one of your like four questions. Emily, I apologize. Like a reminder of the question. I think sticking with just one might be a good choice. Yeah, for yeah. Now. Okay. yeah. Good, good, good. We can always circle back around. Yeah. Uh, and I find that conversations about authenticity 
often sort of become a loop mm. uh, exactly for the reasons you expressed because we're trying to find out where to start. So yeah. we can apply that to the questions too, Good. I think. All right, please. <laughs> I'm just, you know, so trying to unravel over my mind what you're not, I'm not, yeah, trying to respond to that. But um, I mean, I think for me, uh, again, coming from a position of faith, yes, so there's, a, there's an ideal for me that I'm trying, you know, in terms of authenticity that's framed um, in, in my values and my religious beliefs. Um, so for me, there is, I absolutely relate to what you're saying in terms of this, um, from my desire to like really attain that, sort of like take me through a day, you know, where I would start in a day in prayer and have, you know, the best of intentions of what, say, being authentically um, true to um, what God is calling me to do, who I am in him, um, whatever that means, right? To be authentically Fiona as God created me to be. Um, and then I'm falling short of that, right? So there's this constant like back and forth. But yes, I, I understand what you're saying in terms of like that's still authentically me, that I'm failing at being authentic. <laughs> you know, so I can, I can resonate with that. But um, I think just going back to the fashion piece as well in terms of this integrated approach to authenticity, I think that um, that, the cl- that, um, that cl- there's this sense of um, this, this reconciliation of the interior and the exterior to become more and more authentic is, is very interesting to me because uh, um, there's been a couple of quotes that I've used and referred to which are really intriguing to me. And one was from Tom Brown, who I don't know if you all know, um, is a menswear designer um, who grew up in LA, but um, he was quoted in GQ as saying, I, and he obviously he grew up in LA and he was in a particularly hot climate. He was deciding to wear wool flannel suits. And his what he said to the interviewer was, I wore wool flannel because that's how I felt on the inside. Which is so, I mean, I, could, I just can't get away from that quote because that made that to him was authenticity and an expression of his true self, as he would say, or whatever, um, and this sense of reconciling that authentic, authentic self externally by what he was wearing. Um, and then there's another one that stick, comes out to, in my mind, um, which um, is from Lady Gaga, and she was at the Woman in Hollywood Awards in 2018, and she was. A, um, picking an outfit to wear, and normally in those contexts you're wearing an evening gown or whatever, and she was trying one on after the other, and, you know, she was quoted as saying none of these made her feel like herself, right? Um, But then she finds this oversized um, Marc Jacobs suit, which was very exaggerated and really oversized, and she put that on, and then she said, you know, uh, immediately I felt like myself like welling up from the inside, the sense of who I am. And then I finally had the words, I knew what to say. So in a way, this like, which is so intriguing to me. And, but also I can understand that as well in terms of like suddenly you're wearing something that makes you, that facilitates the ability for you to really represent yourself authentically to the world and feel comfortable in actually what you're saying and doing and being as a human being in that moment. So I think that whole piece is really fascinating to me as well in terms of, in terms of authenticity and clothing, facilitating a, an opportunity for you to be authentic or not. Um, you know, because I think, for me, I don't know if anyone else feels this way, but it's, I have this experience every day where I literally, before I get up, I have a sense of exactly what I'm gonna wear and if I don't wear that, I think, and I, I haven't tested it, but I think, because I don't want to, I, I should test it actually, I should wear something else. But I know my day, I would not feel, whether it's authentic or myself for that day. I mean, I knew I was gonna wear this tonight, whether it's gonna be 80 degrees or not. It was just like, this is what I'm wearing, you know? You know and it's, I don't explain that. I mean, that's, it's a very, I mean, and that's on a whole other rambling rabbit hole, but it's still about authentically representing who you are to the world. Um, and what, what does that mean? What does that mean? Why, why do I feel more authentic or more me in that particular outfit one day? Or, or what's, what's wrong about the other thing, you know? And it's just fascinating, but... I, I really wish I had that kind of sartorial clarity. <laughs> I definitely do not wake up that way. I'm like, ah, what, what am I going to do? I don't know. Black. Black is the answer. Um, 
I'm going to ask us a quick sub-question that I don't think will take us too much uh, off topic, but it sounds like for you, um, both fashion and faith are a route to discovering Mm -hmm. who the authentic self is and what to do with that self, how to share it with others, how to know it, et cetera. Um, But I'm wondering if if we can even imagine the possibility of an authentic self, how would sort of how you're struggling with this, you know, complexity and cyclical nature, is there anything in that struggle that would offer purchase in the attempt to figure out who is that self if it exists yeah I mean maybe it, let me give a, a, an example which is sort of re- related in a funny way to some of the, mm-hmm. the quotes Fiona gave and not, not just quotes but mm-hmm. you were talking about your own life yeah. like so this would be a, a, a problem case for me uh, in terms of authenticity that, that is related to what you were just saying so I mean suppose you are invited to a wedding and it you're supposed to it's mm. you're, it's a, a formal wedding and suppose you hate wearing formal clothes mm. so you don't feel at all yourself wearing right. a, whatever fancy clothes you mm-hmm. have to wear um, um, mm. is that is that decision to wear it anyway because it's mm. your let's say your friends getting yeah. married and uh, is that an inauthentic mm-hmm. uh, yeah. decision or or by your lights, because it, it yeah. flunks that test, which I I think has a lot of intuitive force, which is you mm-hmm. should you should wear what like makes you feel, feel like you. Right. Um, in yeah, this case, yeah. you don't feel at all that way, but yeah. uh, arguably it's the right thing to do. Right. But you might yeah. think it's an inauthentic but right, right thing to do, or you might think it is authentic. So right. I don't know. I, mm. Sorry, this has turned into a question for yeah, Fiona, yeah, yeah. but uh, <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> uh, I don't know. What, what what should we think about a case well, like that? Yeah. No, it's a really great question. I mean, I think. Um, you know, it's a very other-centered way of looking. It's, it's really like for the other person, you're dressing for them. And it's a question I asked of a lot of the outliers that I interviewed. Who are you dressing for? Are yeah. you dressing for yourself or are you dressing for others? And that was in different contexts because they were, you know. But I think that it speaks to that and there is an authenticity in that action because you are dressing to make other people feel at ease or to comply with social convention or in that, you know, to conform or, you know, you don't want to ruin their wedding or, you know, ruin the, you know, I've definitely, anyway, I'm not going to tell the story of my wedding and he's somebody who wore something that was totally not, anyway, that's a whole other story, uh, but uh, for another day, yeah, but, um, but I think it's, but it's, I would still argue that it's not, you're still not authentically dressing, you know, you in that, like you're mentioning, right. you're, you don't feel comfortable, so there is a disconnect there, which you're living with, right, yeah. um, for that, and then, Taking, can't wait to get home and take that thing off. I mean, I'm thinking of our, our brother-in-law. He just doesn't, he did wear a tuxedo for his daughter's weddings, but he had on his uh, all-star, you know, sneakers. He just wouldn't, you know, wouldn't wear the dress shoes, you know, so there was a, a, like a compromise there in just the formal, but still partly him, you know. But, we, but oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. But was your thought, it's, it's, it's partly authentic and partly inauthentic. It's yeah. sort of a. It's in terms yes. of authenticity, there's a yeah. clash there. Yeah. yeah. It's a clash. Okay. Exactly. Okay. That's interesting. Yeah, I so. Would you agree with or how would you? I mean, again, I, as you, I'm, I'm no, desperately right. trying to get <laughs> my head around the very idea of authenticity. So I'm mm. I'm uh, I'm way behind you, so to speak. Uh, I don't but, know. Yeah. But I think if authenticity is an expression of value and a value yeah. is care for others, then it can make sense that if something yeah. doesn't feel good physically doing, or yeah. sartorially, but it yeah. feels good as an expression of what you hope for right. most or desire yeah, most, yeah. then there's a kind of nice way to tie mm-hmm. your yeah. kinds of perspectives together, maybe. Yeah. Um, okay, so if we can grant at least the possibility of authenticity, which may itself be a, a complex uh, thing to do, but let's at least try. If we can grant the possibility, then there are a few questions that follow, but I'll try to make fewer than I did last time. <laughs> so if we can grant this possibility, can others truly know us? If there is an authentic self, can someone else other than us, who's not inside our brains, know who that self is? Um, and I think what are, the, what are the risks associated with being known in that way? That was only two. <laughs> Who, whose turn is that? I forget who went. Oh, uh, it is now it Professor Diefenbacher's turn. <laughs> um, yeah, I think other people can know us. Um, certainly, I think that's uh, an intentional choice that we um, 
you know, grant, shall we say, to people in our lives, obviously people that we're in closest relationship to. You think about your family relationships or um, those t really close relationships over time. There's a, obviously a knowledge that builds up there. There's an intimacy. There's a layers that sort of um, fall away. I think it's around, you know, distance in terms of like, you know, think about people you, you first meet, acquaintances, the closer people get to you over time. I think definitely... Um, I would say that they, they know me. Um, I think, you know, when you think about a marital relationship, there's uh, that sense of unconditional love of, you know, you let down your guard, right? They see you warts and all. They see you in your worst moods. Um, yeah, you, you know, that, that's an old ad cliche, but you hurt the ones you love, right? But, I mean, you, you do. You're just like, you're your bare self, which is terrifying, but, that, but it's honest and real and, and also authentic because... Um, you know, it's all of the, the brokenness of, your, of yourself that you're revealing to someone. And that's, you know, the risks of that are obviously, that's, that's scary. Um, and it's, uh, you have to be vulnerable. You have to be willing to let that, to trust that person that they're, you know, not going to blurt out all of your worst, most failings. And, you know, there's a sense of, um, yeah, there's a potential rejection, potential hurt on the other side of that. If that, you know, if that person, you know, takes that and doesn't hold that with deep care in terms of the the moments where you've revealed who you really are um, at your worst moments as well as your best moments. So, yeah. Uh, I agree that people can yeah. can can uh, can know. I mean, our our. Uh, most our, our, our self. I, the question is, what's that what's thing? But let, let's suppose we okay. mean something like yeah. your yeah. deepest values, or, or the way you are, mm. or the, your character mm. in, the, in some deep sense. Uh, I think people can definitely know that. And yeah. um, in fact, I think, in, in fact, this is a familiar fact. People, other people, often know better than you know mm. it yourself. Um, that's a terrifying fact. That yeah. <laughs> not just about incidental features about you, but about really fundamental features. Uh, it's not just that you, um, you aren't in a privileged position, but often other people are in a privileged position, and they're, mm -hmm. they're, mm -hmm. it's all too common for a person to go around, go, go through their whole life, not realizing something pretty basic about them that everyone around them knows very, very well, right? Uh, often a bad thing, right? Uh, um, so I think that's just uh, uh, true. And uh, I mean, uh, Fiona is speaking to a, a, a special case where mm. the loving relationship mm. is, the, is the key that unlocks that. Um, but yeah. th then there are other cases where mm. just another person encountering you, is they're going to see, as it were, what you're, what you're like or what you really care about mm. or what you really value, um, perhaps better than, 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 than you do. Um, and then on the other question about... about the risk in showing mm -hmm. that. I, I, I think there are risks, uh, but I, I want to focus on the other side of that, the opportunities that revealing yourself brings. Mm -hmm. So um, we often uh, carry around, and I think probably not a good way, we, we, we have some view, let's say a political view or a religious view or some other view, but we kind of hide it. Um, and sometimes there are good explanations for why we're hiding it, but one of the hazards of hiding it is that you don't test that thought again or that value in the world, right? And it might be that the thing that you're harboring, and you might even feel a little smug or conceited about it, is actually a bad idea, and you shouldn't have it. And if you talk to anybody about it, they would show you that it was a bad idea. So conversations with other people are one of the most important ways that we learn how to live and how to think and, and so on. And so revealing your, your innermost self is, I think, very, very important for that, for that reason. Because again, your innermost self may be in need of considerable mm improvement uh, mm -hmm. uh, um, and so that's what other people are there for so anyway uh, mm -hmm. okay mm -hmm. <laughs> so it seems like uh, you're sort of agreed in that intimate mm -hmm. relationships and and not even intimate ones sometimes ones with yeah. greater distance even strangers uh, there's a risk that might also be a reward which is that you can be known um, sometimes things about yourself that maybe you don't want to know or you don't want others to know but that there is a possibility of you know revelation or discovery in that mm -hmm. in that process of being known just maybe a, a hopeful note, actually. <laughs> a terrifyingly hopeful note, I would, possibly. I just want to add as well, I think that in faith-based communities, there's a, uh, well, okay, stepping back a bit, in a sense of a relationship with God, there's a, a level of, no, you know, the sense of, okay, being known by my creator, the sense of um, a deeper level of understanding of my, me knowing myself the closer I get in relationship to God, but then also people of that sh shared belief coming together um, there's a, 
an intimacy there, I think, and a permission in those closer relationships within that community where it's almost like a, uh, maybe it's a permission, it's not the right word, but um, yeah, maybe there's a permission for them to be able to speak into your life for sure because you have these shared values and you're coming around this, this set of beliefs um, and that that's aligning you and facilitating this, this, this very deep sort of level of being able to speak truth to one another and also, yeah, be able to see quite deeply into those, those challenging spaces and like being able to be changed by that I think is also something that's compelling to me in that community. All right, we have time for one more question, um, which comes in part um, from the origin of this program. So as you both know, uh, in part, the uh, topic of authenticity arose because the student organizers were really interested in what it means to be authentic themselves and um, just you know in the moment. So what it means to be authentic and can you be authentic, uh, particularly in a world that's saturated with technology and aesthetics. Um, so things like Instagram, um, TikTok. I was going to say Snapchat, but do people use Snapchat anymore? Is it still? It is? Okay. Still a thing. So <laughs> including Snapchat. Uh, and, you know, also um, this app, Be Real. Uh, so I think the interest in, like, basically, can you offer advice or reflection on is it possible to be authentic in a world that is so saturated with those kinds of things? Or possibly are those just parts of what it means to be authentic now? Yeah, so, uh, um, I mean, maybe the first thing to say is I, I, I assume that whatever authenticity and inauthenticity are, that's just a human problem, and it always has been. I mean, um, um, and so I don't think, so to speak, that uh, it, it, it could turn out to be the case that these technologies have exacerbated problems, but it's, it's so to speak, that's what it is. is it's just a standing existential human problem, and then uh, right. Um, and then as for the technology, I, mean, I think I'm not the right person to talk about this. I don't. What do I know? But but but, but um, I'll, I'll I'll maybe say a slightly uh, so sort of existential existential thing about it, which is um, the first thing to say is y- you definitely don't need to use any of those things, right? It can feel like you do have to use them, right? Because um, you're plugged into a particular uh, culture, but you're free to stop using them. And to think that you're not free is to engage in what Sartre would call bad faith. That, is, that would be a form of inauthenticity, if anything is inauthentic, would be to pretend that, so to speak, you can't not look at TikTok or so, you know, uh, that, 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 that's a choice, right? Um, uh, it may f- sometimes feel not like a choice, but it is a choice. And then the second point, which follows on that first point, would be, you know, we should all be asking ourselves, what am I getting out of this exactly? What is this like? How is this <laughs> helping me? And it, the answer can probably just be entertainment. That's that's a that's an answer, right? But we should like take stock of, as we're, what we take ourselves at least to be, um, um, uh, how we take ourselves to be profiting from it. If it has to do with one of the bits of technology that uh, um, have to do with relationships or friendships, like. Are, are these real friendships? Are they are they valuable relationships, whether they're, they count as friendships or not? Um, uh, sometimes it's just getting knowledge. Sometimes it's pure entertainment. But uh, so I mean, this is sort of a meta point. But just uh, um, uh, we have a chance at leading an authentic life with respect to these things, even though once you're thrown into a, a culture or a society where these things are taken for granted, it can feel like that isn't true. It can feel like. No, I, I can't not do Instagram, mm. right? But you, of course you can, right? Um, and, and in fact, it gets easier and easier not to do it once you've stopped doing it. Um, uh, it's like a drug or something, mm. right? Um, but again, as to how it, like, th- th- mm. the extent to which it, it threatens uh, authenticity, uh, there I feel, I'm not mm. sure what to say about that. I'm not, I, I don't feel I'm in a good position. To... Mm-hmm. We can leave that as somewhat yeah. unknown for yeah. now. <laughs> we always have the chance to come back. Yeah. I mean, I definitely I feel in the same, somewhat the same position as Ben, because I'm like probably even older than you are, but I feel that I'm so just, I mean, I can't imagine, it's terrifying to say that I remember life before the internet, <laughs> life before any of this, which is not a few of us left. There's a few of us there, right there, and it's surreal. I mean, I don't think any of you, right, could even imagine what that would be like to not have any of that exist. Um, and I'm just, as I was pondering that question, 
the, what you were mentioning at the end, Emily, it just struck me. It's like, okay, I was immediately going to go to, like, this is what's real to me and authentic, right? I'm, I'm defining, you know, physical presence, being in the presence of one another as the ultimate authenticity in the context of this question. Um, and I think, I think I would argue that that's still true. I, I hope, I don't know, I'd love to hear what you all feel that, um, in the room, but... Um, you know, certainly being through the last two years of the pandemic, right? We've been all being forced into computers and only seeing each other through screens for long periods of time. And that's not how we were built, right? That's not how we were wired at all. Um, so I do feel like on one level, yes, we could, we could assert that being physically present is the goal, is more authentic potentially. But then again, I didn't grow up with this. So Again, that is your is that is that authentic to you? But I think there's um, the levels of engagement with that. Um, it's sort of it's just been fascinating to watch how language has moved from just the verbal, oral, direct speaking to one another or auditory, you know, the voice to nonverbal to emoji to characters. I mean, it's a whole fascinating topic, you know, in terms of like, you know. I don't feel like, I mean, and I start to do it myself, right? We just suddenly start adopting these new ways of communicating with each other. But um, it's just also problematic in terms of, you know, the whole liking system, you know, on, on any of these apps on Facebook or Instagram. And just for me, that just becomes really challenging in terms of, I don't even know how that relates to authenticity, but just, I was just thinking how bizarre. I think there was some, either was a TV show or some kind of bizarre experiment where they were trying to approximate, I, mean, I think they had taken away phones from like how many, you know, teenagers for like a week and it was just terrifying, but they actually started to like mimic like Facebook or Instagram in real time in the, in the apartment and they had like posters with their names and they were putting like colored dots for likes. It was so <laughs> bizarre, but it was like, this is, you know, it was like they were approximating, you know, but I'm, you know, we're not going up and like, like saying, I like you like three times or 20 times, you know, like, what is that? It's super weird. You know, um, I don't know. So it feels like un unauthentic and yet yeah, we're all, um, sucked into it. Like you're saying, and I've deleted the apps from my phone as well. And then, Eventually, I feel like I'm missing out, you know? I mean, I've got to know what's going on in Facebook world um, or whatever, Instagram, you know? Uh, it's complicated, but it's also become part of our lives that now it could be argued is also authentic. I mean, I'm can I, from Ireland and, you know, for me, it's been wonderful to be able to stay connected to my family and friends who are not physically in America, you know? And so there's an authenticity to that activity and social media that's really beneficial, but it's, again, mediating, it's like navigating it and kind of monitoring our time on there. If I can just jump off that last, I mean, theme of, you know, these things being very good. Like, I, I know that I'm in danger of being like an old fogey and thinking this is all terrible. Uh, but the fact is, there's lot, there are lots of things in this that are just fantastic. And so, like, there were these forms of life, which I also remember before the internet. And they were, <laughs> like, here was one of them. You had to go to the library. So you had to get <laughs> on a bus and drive down to the library. And then you had to go into the library and you had to go to the card catalog and stuff. Mm. And it certainly didn't live. It, it, the experience was not of authenticity. The experience was of, this is a giant pain in the neck. Mm -hmm. And I wish I didn't have to do this. Mm -hmm. And the moment, the internet arrived and Wikipedia was there. Yeah. I, I, it just was a great relief. I didn't have to do that anymore. <laughs> and I don't think that I lost anything. I don't yeah. think I, in particular, I didn't lose anything about authenticity in my mm -hmm. life. It was just this arduous, unpleasant, necessary evil, which was eliminated. Mm -hmm. And I think that's true for at least some of the things in, uh, uh, in, in the uh, computer age that we live in. Whether, whether that applies again to mm -hmm. Instagram and Snapchat and TikTok and all these things, that's a different question. Uh, but sort of a nice way to end potentially in thinking maybe we disagree a bit with Plato and that it's not mediation that's necessarily the problem. It's how we use the system of mediation, how it's integrated into our lives, et cetera, and how maybe that connects back mm. to some of the ways we think about if there is an authentic self, how we access it, how we nurture it, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think we have time for uh, a few questions, but first let me just say thank you so much for your answers and your thoughtful reflections. Okay, so I have a question about kind of the conception of authenticity as you guys were discussing it. So assuming that it is a real thing, um, 
the way you guys were, were kind of framing the conversation was as if it's something definite, that like you said, well, okay, well, you can be known as a person. Um, and I was, I was just kind of thinking, okay, well, what, you know, what does it mean for me to be like my authentic self? And I think in a very real sense, we're all in the process of becoming. Like, my authentic self now is not mm-hmm. the same as it would have been, you know, five years ago, even two months ago. Um, so it's kind of just this, this dynamic mm-hmm. process. Um, so I guess I have uh, two questions. The first one is, how does that kind of, um, how does that phenomenon change the way that we as can know both our authentic selves and that we can be known um and then also from like a religious standpoint how does that interplay with the notion that um there is kind of a a a perfect version of ourselves that is the version of us that god wants us to be and is kind of um purifying us into i think tim keller refers to it it as the glory self, the thing mm-hmm. that we will be in heaven one day with him. And is that maybe the most true version of ourselves? Mm-hmm. So I'm kind of curious what you guys think about those. Um, so the first part, yes, that's a brilliant yeah, question, observation, yeah, that we have different authentic selves, like my five-year-old self to like my 50-year-old self. You know, those can't possibly be right the same authentic self. So I think that speaks to like that sort of continuum. I was kind of speaking to the beginning, kind of this you're constantly shifting, um, but it doesn't mean it's less authentic, it's authentic at that moment, right? So, um, and I think that in terms of um, religious faith, that speaks to like that sanctification process of becoming more holy um, and sort of growing in our faith. And, you know, by practicing that, we are becoming. I mean, I think of um, uh, this fashion cultural theorist, um, Susan Kaiser, actually uses that term a lot in terms of coining our terms of like us and becoming um, in terms of identity and in those intersectionalities at any point in time that we are adopting those different subject positions that we are becoming more and more of ourselves. Um, the glory, I mean, my whole thesis was kind of almost speaking to your second question, so I, I would love to just talk about that for so much longer, but uh, uh, what I was writing about in my thesis and my MA um, was really looking at embod- future embodiment because I feel like the discourse currently um, around all of these topics in terms of identity, um, apart from the a belief in the future body and that glorified body that you mentioned, um, only deals with this life, right? So it's dealing with the natural and not the supernatural. So I wanted to also address that in terms of that potent, that future perfect body um, and just to really um, kind of situate where we are in, the, in, this, in this moment because we're living in a, I would say, all right, argue a broken world, a fallen world, and I'm broken and I'm never going to reach perfection in this life, but um, there's that hope for that future glorious body to come where there will be that restoration redemption of that flaw. So maybe, you know, that's the full potential, um, you know, authenticity to come, right, will be actually, it's possible in the future. Um, yeah, I don't know if that's a shorter answer. Uh, uh, oh, wait, there you are. Yeah, I, 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 I agree with Fiona's response to the first part of what you said, that it's a really important point. We, and yeah. we were, or at least I was sometimes speaking yeah. about yeah. this as, uh, the, you know, the authentic self is like a static mm. thing. And in fact, as you were saying, we're, we're building ourselves, yeah. right? We're, we're trying to, uh, and again, what that, that's a metaphor. What, what the literal truth there is, is, is mm. would be an answer to the question, what is authenticity and inauthenticity? But let's suppose it's something like we're trying to figure out what we value or what we ought to value or what, what's important to us or what matters or how, in terms of what things we should live our lives. And that, as you were saying, is a, is a process that happens over time. It's also a slightly paradoxical process. Um, my, my ex-wife Agnes, who teaches here too, wrote a book on that called Aspiration, which is you, you, have, you, you start without the thing that you're, you nevertheless need to be thinking in terms of, right? So you, you, it, um, with normal Desires, you you know, you have the desire and it's fully contentful. I, I want to, you know, I want a candy bar, and that that explains why you go to the store, right? Mm-hmm. But in these cases, the thing that you're constructing is the very value at issue. It's right, so you don't have that antecedently. You're sort of trying to <coughs> turn yourself into something, and that's that's a very st- interesting, strange, wonderful. 
process, and it's a somewhat paradoxical process. But in any event, I think you're right that whatever we want to say about authenticity, it's, 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 it's a thing that involves us constituting ourselves this way. And then, of course, we can fail to live up to whatever it is. That, that, that is in, assuming for a second there is such a thing as an inauthentic life, it's going to be that we're not living up to that, to that uh, uh, um, whatever it is. Um, on, the other, on the other side of the equation, I mean, the, 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 the second part of what you're saying, I mean, again, I've already told you, I, I'm, I'm a little bit unsure about the whole concept of authenticity. And I, uh, the, 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 the set of ideas that I think authenticity and inauthenticity may sometimes be standing proxy for are just regular old ethical concepts, like what is a good human life? What sort of life should I be leading? The, one way to put my, my doubts is, are we, miss, are we leaving anything out if we talk that way as opposed to talking about our true selves or living authentically? What, why not just say, I need to figure out what a good life is or what a good life is for me? Um, um, that's just a, that's a kind of a much more familiar sort of ethical uh, question. And getting clear about what authenticity would be would be seeing how, the, how it relates to that other ethical uh, 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 question. Anyway, there's a lot more to be said about that, but I'll, I'll, stop, I'll stop there. Uh, uh. Anyone else want to come up with a question? I want to say thank you both for joining us tonight. Um, I recently read a book by someone named O. Allen Noble called uh, You Are Not Your Own, and it talks about, it, it talks a, a lot about like what is wrong with modernity in a lot of different ways, uh, frames like this whole like bleak picture, and then it talks about how that affects us as individuals. It puts us in a position uh, because of technology, because of how interconnected our world is, and because we have uh, also these values in the West of individualism and freedom and self-expression. We have this, what, what he calls the responsibility of self-belonging, which becomes a very burdensome thing on um, modern, especially youth, uh, to define yourself and to express yourself in a certain way, and there's no objective standard to which you're aspiring because it's, it's something that's like undefined. You have to figure it out for yourself. And so you're constantly expressing and you're constantly being perceived by others and you feel like you have to meet like certain expectations you want to have for yourself, certain expectations from others, certain affirmation from other people, um, and you, but you can't really figure out what that means. And so it's just like exhausting and people are burning out and that's like a millennial and Gen Z problem. Um, so... I don't. Know, I don't know what the Be Real app is. Um, I know what I know. Instagram and I know Twitter and Facebook and I know all these other <laughs> things that are um, places where we express ourselves and we're also we are seeing other people expressing themselves and we are being perceived by other people. And I just wanted mm -hmm. your takes on um, maybe how authenticity can be defined in this context or maybe how it's changed because of these, because of technological advancements or mm. um, like how it interacts with this idea of like performativity um, and self-expression in like a performative kind of age. That's, that's a lot of stuff, but yeah. That's, yeah. that's, that's <laughs> awesome. You want to go for you? All right, that was my kind of question. I really, I appreciate <laughs> okay, that. Yeah, really. I was like 20 I like those point. layers. That's excellent. Please, would you what like to start? What was the question? <laughs> <laughs> um... I think that, I mean, I think it sort of tags on. I don't actually know exactly what the Be Real app is. You take pictures in real time, right? And you load them up, right? So it's something like, instead of Instagram that's hyper-stylized, where like you want to take a picture of your living room and you like, yeah. you know, put away all the laundry and you like, oh, no, I didn't leave three popcorn bowls there. It's all clean and it's beautiful. Uh, and instead, this is, I think you use front and back camera, right? You take a photo of yourself in, that is exactly in the moment. And so mm. it's supposed to like mm. um, erode okay. some of the sort of performance and like smoothness is that right like the idea is it's more real because you're not mm. you know putting on makeup and changing things and putting away your laundry is that is that accurate yeah oh. yes amazing yeah. all right that's it yeah okay all right i don't know if that helped me think through the answer but um, <laughs> <laughs> um i mean i think uh, one answer is that we are all we're all performing whether we're whether it's uh you know human condition, how we're living and being and acting and doing our gestures, dressing, all of the above is all performative, right? So whether it's, you know, it's just a matter of 
deciding whether you feel like it's you know more performative or less performative or extra performative now that we've got the technology. It's, it's different ways to add to performativity as human beings, um, but we were always doing that in terms of you know performing ourselves. Right now, we're on a stage. You're you know we're all still performing this act of becoming ourselves and being ourselves and inhabiting bodies. Um, but I think it's, it's definitely taken it to another level. Um, I think it's, for me, it's, uh, it's very stressful, I think, to have to feel like I have to engage in all of this all of the time. I don't know how you all do that. And, you know, just, I just have moments where I decide I'm going to engage or not with particular technology. Um, but I do feel, it's interesting, this idea of the, the phone um, that's just become part of us and sort of like extension. It's like always in our hand. It's the first thing, which is a bad habit that is in my hand because it's our alarms, which most of us probably are doing as well. So I, I pick it up before I'm up. You know, it's just very problematic for me, this relationship with this device um, that then leads me into this full-on, like, performative engagement in a world that isn't... Okay, we can argue is maybe it is real and it's, it's authentic in its own way, but I think it's leading me away from engagement in ways that I would find more authentic with people in conversation in real time, real time, which can still be FaceTime now. I'm realizing as I'm saying all this, it's like contradicting, but um, it's definitely more performative, but I think we, we're performing with or without technology, so yeah. Yeah, speaking of performing without technology, I mean, I, yeah. again, because I'm not totally sure what authenticity is, I'm not sure when You're being right. performative <laughs> or performing is inauthentic. Mm. I, I think I know sometimes when it's a bad idea or it's vicious mm. or you shouldn't mm. be that way. But again, those are ethical concepts, mm. not. Um, but, but I think it's sometimes a good thing. And again, if authenticity and goodness are mm -hmm. analytically related, then it's going to be authentic. Uh, I'll give an example. Uh, Sorry, it's not an example where I'm sure what the answer is, but I, it's that I'm not sure that it's bad. Um, 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 Chris Rock uh, has a joke where he says, when you go on a first date, you're not meeting that person, you're meeting their representative. Mm. Um, and and his, <laughs> his thought is, you know, we all know what we do on a first date, or, or at least what almost all of us do, right? We wear things we don't normally wear, and we sort of act ways we don't normally act, and we bring up topics we don't normally bring up, and so on and so <laughs> forth, right? We wear cologne and makeup and all this stuff. Um, uh, now the question is, is, is that a bad thing, right? Um, it's certainly a performance, right? It, um, but um, y you might think, well, it's a first date. So you're, <laughs> you're as it were, it isn't a normal situation. It's a weird situation. And you might think that you can explain why that's the right thing to do in terms of that, the weirdness of that situation, right? Um, 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 what, it, you know, it, it, is it problematic to want to make a good first impression, for example, right? Um, uh, is that... Or is that, a, is that a bad, is that a defective concept to begin with? Anyway, I guess my point is I, I would tend to approach all these questions just ethically rather than in terms of whether it corresponds to your true self, whatever that might be. The question is, is this going to, is your life going to go well as a result of having performed in this way? Um, and maybe that's all we mean by authenticity. That would be fine. But uh, uh, mm. anyway. So it's the Instagram self who goes on the first date, you know, <laughs> right. or maybe the first couple, and then the popcorn bowls come out, yeah. you know, like fourth or fifth. Yeah, <laughs> you can take off the filter after a few days. Um, anybody else want to ask a question? We have time for a few more, I think. Hi. Well, I actually had two questions, but one of them already got asked by my friend. So um, uh, thankfully, I no longer have to pick. Um, so my question is regarding this proposed definition of like authenticity as doing actions, it's, it's like having actions that represent your core values or beliefs. And that comes up, you know, possibly short because aren't all of our actions things that represent our core values and beliefs. And regarding that, um, I want to bring up possibly a challenge, possibly a complication. I don't know what it is. Um, <laughs> and, uh, it, it, it is rooted in like my Christian beliefs, but I think it's something that anybody could possibly relate to. Um, in uh, Romans chapter seven, the apostle Paul writes about um, uh, a situation where like he he is saved and he 
no longer wants to sin because he knows he's under grace and he's being sanctified, yet he continues to sin. And so he says that, like, it is the sin in me that causes me to sin, yet I myself do not want to do. And he says, I, 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 I do what I do not want to do. Mm-hmm. And this is something that um, uh, the uh, famous theologian Augustine picks up on in his confessions when he even, like, goes as far to say that, like, I have two wills. Mm-hmm. And so I guess, like, it seems from these two authors that there's this possible condition where you have, like, conflicting mm-hmm. values and beliefs. And so in that sense, like, Worse. is authenticity mm-hmm. a choice between those two related to? Or possibly, like, if there's one that you're moving towards, is authenticity acting in that way? Um, or if there's one that you know that is right, is authenticity acting in that way? So is it possible that, like, these two, you know, works hint at this idea of, like, conflicting beliefs and values? And how does that, like, complicate or challenge the idea of authenticity as merely the acting out of core beliefs and values? Mm. Yeah, should I go? Or, sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think that's very helpful. I, um, um, it, that is to say, you've put on center stage. Mm. I, I, I take one of the main questions, which is, can you do what you do not want to do? I was, in effect, saying mm-hmm. no. And, but you're reminding us that almost everybody says, yes, yeah. of course you can do what you don't, right? Um, that's the question which goes back to at least Socrates of, you know, is weakness of will possible? Is it possible to know that, you know, to have as a considered judgment that you shouldn't do X and do X anyway? Socrates, who was a weirdo, said, no, you can't ever do that, right? And I was sort of pushing the Socrates line. But nobody agrees with Socrates about that, right? Everybody thinks, everybody uh, thinks that you can act against your own best judgment, right? We take that to be a characteristic, lamentable feature of human life, right? That we're, con- we're constantly, we, we know we shouldn't sin in this way, and yet we do, right? Um, so let me stick up for the Socrates answer, because, so, so to speak, if Socrates is right, then we're back to my problem. If Socrates is wrong, then I think you've found some room for mm-hmm. the, cons- the distinction between authenticity and inauthenticity. Um, uh, I, I, I mean, sorry, Socrates talks a lot about this in many different dialogues, but let me, so I'll give you my own sort of take on this. The, the thought is, um, um, what and I, I sort of said this at the beginning of the, of the discussion, what explains the fact that a person does the thing that they're telling us they know they shouldn't be doing? Like, what is that? It's not just a reflex action, like if somebody hits your elbow or something, right? It, it corresponds to something in them, right? So they say, I know I shouldn't eat this whole cake, and then the next thing you know, they've eaten the whole cake. Uh, um, why did they eat the cake? That's a legitimate question which we have to ask. Now, it, it, it's fine to say things like, well, they were tempted. But the, 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 the whole point is to be tempted is for a desire in you to be activated. So now we've got, a, um, now your point was right, exactly. We've got conf- conflicting desires. But the question is, why should we uh, valorize or um, validate the, uh, the, the desire that you didn't act on as your real, genuine, true self rather than the other way? But what Socrates wants to say is, the way to tell what somebody really values is what they do. And if they eat the cake, then they value the cake, right? And they may cry about it, but that, that, that's what, that was their true self, if you, if you want to use that. That, that. that was what they really cared about. That's what really mattered to them. It's a sort of tragic or pessimistic view. It's like, if you want to see what a person actually cares about, look, look at their actions, not at their, at their, their, their words. Um, but anyway, I, I, all, I may be wrong about this, and Socrates may be wrong about it, so I... And even I think you put your finger on mm-hmm. the, uh, maybe the crucial question about uh, how to make sense of authenticity. Mm. Um, I mean, I think I resonate obviously with the quote and with that that wrestling. You know, Paul speaks about that too, right? The good that you want to do, don't do, et cetera. And there's this there's this constant wrestling in the life of a believer between you know the flesh and the spirit, right? We believe that we have the the Holy Spirit residing in us, that there's an opportunity for us to get closer to this ideal, right? This glorious body that we won't have until um, there's 
the future, the, the new heaven and earth has come into being in this redemption, redemption of our bodies, redemption of the world, and this reconciliation, right, in an ultimate sense. So I think if you're, for us as a believer, if you're looking, we are, it's about perfection, right? There isn't, there is an opportunity to become perfect, right? And to live free from, we would say, sin, free from brokenness, free from that tension of the temptation of wanting to eat the cake, eating the cake, you know, all of this back and forth, that there is an op- there's this goal, there's this hope, this promise that we can live a life where that will be gone. And we will be making, you know, it's not even about making, the choices won't be there to make. We will just be, we'll be fully realized in that perfected sense of humanity, right? That's that, if that's that ideal of the fully authentic human, in terms of like perfect, where we're not flawed, where I'm not thinking all those, even if I do the very best I can from an outward standpoint, there's still the brokenness inside, the motives, the heart, the all the thoughts that are flawed and not ideal and totally, but again, yet authentic because they're me and the brokenness of me. So, ah, but you know, there's that, re- that hopeful reconciliation, um, I think, down the road of not having that tension for the Christian, that that's what we're striving towards, hoping towards, that's the promise of that, um, as that auth- goal of that authenticity, maybe, in its most full sense that we're seeking. I mean, maybe one possibility we haven't talked about yet is just that we, you know, we've, we've asked questions about authenticity, but authenticity as if there's one answer or one tradition that can solve all the questions. And maybe one possibility is a tradition that draws on Paul and Augustine arrives at a different valid answer from what you know, a tradition that draws on Socrates might say, and that they're not reconcilable, but there's potential sort of productive tension, um, maybe you know, drawing on your own uh, sort of interest in that space in between mm-hmm. uh, an answer like yours and an answer like yours. Mm-hmm. Hi. Um, so naturally, as a philosophy major, I have to take the last few questions asked and turn the dial all the way to 100. Um, but I'm basically wondering, with what we've discussed about these conflicting or you know, singular or um, numerous definitions for this idea of authenticity, if what we've discussed also may pose a very credible threat to even establishing one definition at all for something like authenticity. And one thing I think... Um, I might try to inject into this whole discussion would just be this idea of conflict, right? Um, I think there are often times we can uh, relatably make a decision and then, you know, an hour, say like an hour passes and we look back upon it retrospectively and say, you know, it's like, what the heck were we thinking then? Um, And I think this relates to this idea of viewing authenticity as something that's not purely static and something that is more, you know, intertemporal through multiple time periods. Um, people talk about how, you know, they frequently can change personalities or they've had a revelation and they've made, you know, say drastic life changes. Um, I'm wondering if that really introduces this new idea of kind of peeling away layers of conscience. Because we've talked about, I, th- I know that we talked a little bit about this idea of the performative aspect of authenticity and kind of having to strip that away to, you know, discover one's true authentic self. I guess my complication I would pose is, you know, how many layers of that are you going to have to pull back? It's like the kind of fashion analogy, um, you know, how many, you know, even if you're, um, one is removing all their clothes, you know, what is that still their authentic self? It's that idea of the subjectivity within that definition. I guess another um, analogy from my personal experience is I used to play competitive chess and oftentimes upon deliberating on even a single move, players often have to spend um, over half an hour, sometimes even an hour on you know, debating the multiple moves they could make, um, evaluating the merits of it. And I know we talked a little bit about how one, like what Socrates said, one can evaluate um, an individual's values by their actions solely. But I'm just wondering if, you know, there's a sense of an opportunity cost of the moves that were considered, the, I guess, actions and decisions that were considered but never made. And I guess that also relays back to my um, original overarching question of how um, kind of layers of conscience or indecisiveness or 
conf- conflict within the self might pose um, existential threat to the very idea of being able to establish a definition for authenticity. He said, philosophy, so you have to go. <laughs> I, I mean, uh, just to speak to the idea of opportunity costs, and here I'm, again, doing it more in the ethical idiom than the authenticity idiom. I mean, as, as you know, uh, um, um, when Socrates is in prison and about to be executed, his friend Crito comes to him and says, I've, we've bribed the guards, we can get you out of here. And Socrates starts doing his usual thing and saying, well, is it okay for me to leave, right? And he says, we don't have time for that. Like, we'll, we'll talk about that on, on the way, right? They say, no, we have to talk about it right now, right? Um, and you might say, you, you could hear that as an opportunity cost thing. It's like, look, they're gonna kill you, right? Um, uh, um, but Socrates' thought is, there's no way around figuring out the answer to the question, should I do this? Is this a good thing? Like, right? and, and, and so to speak, uh, of course, it, it, if the answer turned out to be, it's okay for me to leave, and I haven't left, then it, there's been an opportunity cost. But the point is, at time T, the only thing we can ever do is figure out whether it's the right thing. So it, uh, we, can, we can't hop over that step, that's, because that's a- asking the question at issue. So, um, so I think the, uh, the very idea of an opportunity cost, it's so to speak, uh, 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 it, I'm not sure that's a, itself an actionable concept, right? You, got, you still have to figure out what's the right, <laughs> what's the right thing to do here. Uh, that's only picking up on a small piece of the second part of what you were saying, but uh, I don't know, did, did you want to? I mean, I think just, uh, again, from the uh, Christian perspective, I mean, uh, you, you know, you have to get into, like, the sovereignty of God, right, or, or a free will to make choices, right, on any given topic or life choice or chess moves or whatever, right, in this sort of um, yes, there's, you know, maybe we make a misstep, but there's this uh, free... Uh, rest in a way or kind of um, reassurance I think for myself knowing that um, there is an omniscient all-knowing good um, sovereign entity um, that I believe in in the world that has oversight of that and that it, you know whether I make a there's that uh, verse that talks about whether you turn to the left or right you'll hear a voice behind me saying this is the way walk in it right and it sounds very poetic and whatever right if you're not a believer but it's reassuring to me because it's like well Fiona if you go this way you go that way it's still going to be within my will right there's it's not the sense of making a wrong turn you know when big decisions or small decisions so um, and that's part of the process of um, you know becoming more and more hopefully like God so are walking more faithfully. 